Uh, a very good morning to one and all. I'm Dr. Sridhar Sundaram and on behalf of the Indian Society of Gastroenterology, I welcome you all to this edition of the ISD Masterclass. Today we have uh, an eminent speaker with us, uh, Professor Pooja Sarkuja. She's the professor and head of the Department of Pathology uh, at GB Pant Institute of uh, Postgraduate Education and Research. She's uh, a very, very experienced GI pathologist and she'll be discussing normal and abnormal gastric and esophageal biopsies. Uh, we also have two distinguished panelists with us. Uh, I'm happy to introduce my teacher and my mentor, uh, Professor Shobna Bhatia. She uh, will be joining us in another 10 minutes. And a very dear friend, a close friend of mine, Manas Panigrahi, who's an additional professor at Ames Bhubaneswar in the Department of Gastroenterology. So uh, without further uh, uh, ado, I think uh, uh, Professor Pooja, you can, you can take over the proceedings. Okay, <clears throat> thank you so much uh, for a kind uh, welcome and uh, it's an honor to be part of this uh, ISG masterclass organized by ISG. Um, so I'd like to thank all the organizers for including me in this session of pathology. Uh, as you know, the topic is interpretation of normal and abnormal gastric and esophageal biopsies. And as I believe that my target audience is predominantly gastroenterology fellows or uh, gastroenterologists, I'm going to try and keep this topic to the things that they maybe should know and things that we would like them to know and how it would make a, a better correlation between pathology and gastroenterology. So without further ado, let's go to the first poll question, if that can be shared. <clears throat> Okay, so um, I think we've got a fair number of results now. So uh, most of you have said one in five, but actually the correct answer is one in 10. So the minimum adequate volume for fixative per unit of tissue is one in 10. So when you're sending your biopsy, if you send it in a, uh, you know, like those old penicillin vials or sometimes in those urine culture type of bottles, usually there is enough fixative, so it's not a problem. Once in a while, people send in a small ependorf or a, a smaller uh, glass tube, in which case you must ensure that the formalin to biopsy ratio is uh, biopsy to formalin ratio is one in 10 volume wise. Okay. So if that is there, then there will be adequate fixation of the tissue. So now let's move on. <clears throat> So let's first look at the normal morphology of the esophagus. What I'm going to try and do is take you through the normal morphology of esophagus and stomach first, and then we'll talk about the non-neoplastic and neoplastic disorders of both conditions. So the normal morphology of the esophagus, as all of you are familiar with, is um, uh, it is in the thoracic compartment of the body with um, a, a length of up to 36 to 40 centimeters approximately uh, from the incisors. Now, the uh, I don't need to show you this. Actually, the only importance of showing you this is that it is important on the form that it must be mentioned either which part of the thoracic compartment or how much distance from the incisors has the biopsy been taken from because that gives the pathologist a good idea of where the biopsy is from as as we go ahead you'll see that different areas will have a different significance and sometimes we might have to ask you to take more biopsies from a different area of the uh, esophagus if we think enough have not been taken as in eosinophilic esophagitis or even bats etc so we'll come to that now this is of course a whole mount view of a full thickness of esophagus just to show all the layers and that is common to all the intestine that there is mucosa, lamina propria, muscularis mucosa, submucosa, muscularis propria and adventitia in the esophagus, the rest of the uh, intestine has cirrhosa and there are minor differences here and there. The dotted lines, as I'm showing here, is where a biopsy would actually be taken from. So a biopsy would typically include some mucosa, 
some lamina propria and muscularis, and depending on the site of biopsy, it may or may not include much of the submucosa. So that is something to keep in mind. We may not always see submucosa, but uh, that depends on the biopsy. Now, if the submucosa is included, there are these mucus glands that are present in the submucosa, which are not an indication that this is from the G junction. These are just mucus glands that, so if they are mentioned in the report, they are normally seen in the esophagus in the submucosa. The uh, esophageal mucosa, of course, is comprised of stratified squamous type of epithelium. Now, having a look at that, the stratified squamous epithelium has a basal layer. Then there is, of course, the stratum spongiosum, and then the, uh, the, there is no keratinization, of course, in the uh, esophagus under normal conditions. Now, what's important to note is that the basal layer usually occupies about 15% of the thickness of the <clears throat> squamous epithelium. And these cells are small cuboidal to columnar cells with a higher NC ratio, dark nucleus as compared to the remaining cells above this layer, as you can see. And these are about two to three to four cell layer thick. Uh, the lamina propria underneath it sends in little tongues into this squamous epithelium, which are called subepithelial papillae or papillary tongues of lamina propria. These are usually located up to one third thickness of the entire thickness of the squamous epithelium. So this is normal, right? Certain number of inflammatory cells in the lamina, even intraepithelially, are normal. So in the lamina and per hypothelium, you can get up to 15 neutrophils or eosinophils and some say even up to 50 lymphocytes, but often the count is lower. And intraepithelially, the count will be much lower, up to one to two neutrophils to eosinophils per hypothelium. And the lymphocytes are usually present around the papillae. Now, before I move further, the mitotic activity also, you know, the epithelium is regenerating. So throughout the GI tract, mitotic activity can be seen, but is usually seen in the base, basal cells of the uh, squamous epithelium, base of the crypts of the glandular epithelium. Now, as you can see in this high part, these tiny dots are all lymphocytes, so you can normally also certain number of lymphocytes which are more aggregated near the subepithelial papillae that are present but can be in the uh, <clears throat> now let's come to the poll question two uh, Arvind if you can launch the poll question please Okay, so which immunostain that can identify the squamous epithelium? And your choices were uh, <coughs> cytoplasmic, CK20, nuclear. See, that's also the location of the immune stain, not just the type of the immune stain. So that's very important to note. Nuclear P63, cytoplasmic P40, all of the above. <coughs> So if, um, how many participants we have? Has everyone uh, shared it? So anyway, I'll go ahead now. Most people must have answered. So um, the correct answer is actually someone, something that nobody has picked. It is nuclear P63. So nuclear P63 is the correct answer. CK20 is the cytoplasmic stain, but is seen in the lower GI tract. Cytoplasmic P40 is wrong. P40 is an immune stain that will stain that, but nuclear again, not cytoplasmic, and therefore not all of the above. So the correct answer, in fact, is nuclear P63. We can uh, finish with this poll now. So this is an example. Now, cytoplasmic, uh, you can close this poll now. So cytoplasmic staining of cytokeratin 5-6 can be seen in the squamous epithelium. 7 is usually in the upper GI tract uh, glandular epithelium and 20 in the lower GI tract glandular epithelium. P63 is a nuclear stain. P40 is also a nuclear stain that will stain the uh, <clears throat> squamous epithelium a little more intensely in the basal cells and also in the remaining superficial cells. 
So the, let's have a look now at the gastroesophageal junction. The junction is the junction of the squamous epithelium at the distal esophagus and the proximal stomach at the cardia. Now the cardia is actually a very short segment uh, measuring about less than half a centimeter. And this region of the junction usually shows pure mucus glands, not the specialized cells that we see in the remaining part of the stomach. And occasional auxentic cell can be seen, but usually pure mucus glands. Whereas the cardia, as you go more into the cardia of the stomach or reach the fundus, the number of specialized cells will increase. This knowledge is important because we need to differentiate it from Barrett's esophagus, of course, knowing where the biopsy has been taken, as I'll come to that later, and from intestinal metaplasia at the gastric cardia. So these things I will discuss later. So this is an example of the gastroesophageal junction. This is the squamous epithelium, the glandular epithelium, and as you can see, it is predominantly comprised of mucus secreting cells and not of any specialized cells, no auxentic cells, no uh, parietal cells or cheap cells as we know them. This is a, a diagrammatic representation of the same, the esophagus, I think the cardia is looking a little too long in this, and then the fundus body and antrum. So we'll now come to the uh, stomach before we go on there. So CK56 will stain the squamous epithelium and you can see here, it does not stain the glandular mucosa of the GE junction. This is what is we call multi-layered epithelium. Now this may be seen at the gastroesophageal junction, but if it is seen more proximally, what it shows is squamous type of epithelium and at the superficial part of it is the glandular epithelium. So we call this multi-layered epithelium. At the G junction, it may be normal, but in the more superficial part, if it is present, it may be an indication of Barrett's esophagus and one should carefully look for the evidence of Barrett's esophagus at such a point. Now, the normal morphology of the stomach, again, the same four layers. The additional part, of course, is that there is an inner oblique muscle where a circular longitudinal is seen throughout the intestine. This is not really important when we're talking about biopsies because they don't go down to the main muscle layer. Can we share poll question three, please? <clears throat> I believe you're all seeing a little diagram, an HME picture of a part of the <coughs> gastric uh, mucosa. And what you need to tell me is, is it from the G-junction, cardia, body, or antrum? <coughs> picture is not visible, I think, ma'am. Um, is it visible, Arvind? Well, some people are answering, so I wonder if uh, it is visible. No, the picture is not seen, ma'am. I think... Uh, no, I cannot see it on my screen, actually. Uh, I can only see the whole format. So, I'm not sure uh, uh, if the picture is visible or not. Anyway, I think we just go ahead then, because if the picture is not visible, then I'll show you which picture it was in the next... Uh, minute and this is actually a picture of the gastric body mucosa so this on the upper right square is the picture i had shared and this is a picture of the gastric body of fundus mucosa on our left upper we have the gastric cardia uh, this is just a high power view of the gastric fundus mucosa and this is the gastric antral mucosa so now what is important to note here is that whether it is cardia, fundus, or body, or antrum, the superficial part is the same, which is what we call the superficial glandular zone, which is all composed of the foveolae, gastric foveolae, having uh, tall columnar epithelial cells with a basal nucleus, and the rest is occupied by mucid. It is the deep glandular zone that is different in each of these three, four regions. So the deep glandular zone in the cardia will have a few auxentic cells, but the remaining cells are mucous cells and the, it's slightly sparsely populated, if you can see. Whereas the fundus and body are very densely packed with specialized cells. The chief cells, the parietal cells, the endocrine cells. And when we go on to the 
antrum again it is more of mucus cells and endocrine cells and less of the uh, specialized cells so this upper layer which is highlighted by the red box is common to the entire stomach but with a difference which i'll just show you in this diagrammatic representation so in the cardia and the fundus body the uh, superficial glandular zone is shorter however the entire thickness of the cardia is also shorter but in the cardia it's occupying about 50% now in the fundus it occupies just about the upper 1/4 or 1/5 of the mucosa and the mucosa and the fundus body and antrum is thicker but in the antrum the uh, superficial glandular zone again occupies about 50% of the thickness so it is least in the fundus body and more in the antrum now this is a high power view showing these specialized cells which we can identify by the presence of these uh, bluish or pinkish granules so these make them a little different from the usual mucus cells which you can see over here and even here these are the regular mucus cells which are pale in color the cytoplasm whereas a granular eosinophilic or basophilic cytoplasm would indicate g4 parietal cells the endocrine cells are also present haphazardly scattered here and they usually have if you see over here this sort of slightly triangular appearance with a dense eosinophilic uh, cytoplasm of course now with uh, so much immunohistochemistry if i need to identify these i can use immunohistochemical tools now this is a mucin stain which is important because later we may need to use it for certain diagnosis it is important to know that the stomach throughout the stomach we see only one type of mucin normally and that is neutral mucin which picks up the ps stain in a periodic acid shift alcyon blue stain combination the alcyon blue stains blue as the name indicates periodic acid stains magenta and this is picked up by the ps neutral mucin magenta stain the lower gi tract after the stomach it has acid mucins which are picked up by the alcyon blue stain the immunohistochemically we have different types of mucins also mark 1 2 5 and 6 are the common ones in the gi tract or which mark 5 ac as it's called is the one which is most common in the stomach so tumors that have a gastric phenotype will show positivity for mark 5 ac for example even anterior carcinomas can have a gastric phenotype and there they will then stain with mark 5 ac so it is good useful to see this to identify a particular type of phenotype now this is a synaptophysin stain which will pick up the endocrine cells now this is a biopsy from the gastric body mucosa and as these dark brown stained are the endocrine cells and as i told you these are slightly triangular in shape and these are haphazardly arranged throughout the uh, crypts in the gastric body mucosa whereas if we go to the antrum see this is the antrum with the deep superficial glandular zone and this is the deep glandular zone in the antrum there are much more numerous endocrine cells and these endocrine cells are almost arranged like a band because they are so numerous and present in the superficial part of the deep glandular zone that it almost stains like a band and this is also helpful to note to be able to identify different areas of the uh, gastric uh, mucosa some when a biopsy has been sent to us and also because sometimes we need to see if there's any endocrine cell hyperplasia so now let's come to the non neoplastic or inflammatory conditions of the esophagus wherein the most common condition is gastroesophageal reflux disease or gerd now uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease um, okay before we go on further poll question 4 please so where should you biopsy to diagnose gerd so where should the clinician take the biopsy from less than 1 cm 1 to 2 more than 2 or more than 3 okay so it's nice to know that a question that should be answered more by clinicians is being uh, given a 
better. Most of you, 44% have answered correct for the gastroesophageal, more than two centimeter above G junction. That is the correct site. If you go below that, then often there is, there may be uh, uh, the presence of certain inflammatory cells or glandular mucosa, which will hinder the correct diagnosis. So therefore, it should be at least above two centimeters of the gastroesophageal junction to make a diagnosis, to give a correct diagnosis of GERD. So now let's look at the, um, sorry. So uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, as we know, is when there are reflux symptoms. And if we see a biopsy that shows, which I'll come to, certain changes of reflux without inflammation, then we also just call it as consistent with gastroesophageal reflux. When we see the addition of inflammatory cells, then we call it reflux esophagitis. So it does not have to show us inflammatory cells, in which case we just call it symptoms are consistent with reflux. When to biopsy, now, as you all know, most of you don't biopsy routinely, uh, you know, may not, because it's pretty... Um, common, you know what the patient is having, you may not even do an endoscopy, but if you're suspecting for any reason, parrots or carcinoma, it's a long-standing reflux, there are risk factors, you want to rule it out, or if the patient has atypical symptoms like chronic cough and you're not sure if the symptoms are actually uh, reflux or something else, or if a patient is on refractory treatment, then probably you would take a biopsy, and this is probably a question that you can answer better than I can. Where to biopsy? As I said, definitely more than two centimeters above the gastroesophageal junction because some squamous hyperplasia and occasional gastric uh, tongues and especially in hiatus hernia, there can be changes that are there in the uh, mucosa between one to two centimeters of the gastroesophageal junction. In addition, you must target any areas of suspected metaplasia or dysplasia or any visual abnormality. It is good to take additional biopsies in separate vials from the normal area, from the gastric cardia and the stomach. So that one can see where is the greater degree of inflammation, which is the key focus point of the pathology and where these other changes may just be uh, changes that are uh, pa going parallel to that or just like a reactive changes because of the main pathology. So even if the main pathology is in the gastric fundus, we may say some inflammatory changes in the uh, esophagus. So if you take a few biopsies from the cardia and other regions of the stomach, it is definitely helpful. They should all be in different bottles and labeled separately. Histological criteria for GERD, one, basal cell hyperplasia. I told you normal is up to 15%, so it should be more than that or five to six cell layer thick. Second, more than two thirds of the thickness of the squamous epithelium is where these papillary projections of the lamina propria are reaching. Then if there is esophagitis, then you can see neutrophils, eosinophils, and lymphocytes in the squamous epithelium. In addition, you can see intercellular edema. So this is a photomicrograph showing the basal cells hyperplasia, which has reached almost 50% rather than the lower 15% where they should be. These darker staining cuboidal to columnar cells are going right up to this point. Then... Uh, this is another photomicrograph. The arrows are pointing towards inflammatory cells. I think the blue ones are eosinophils and the uh, black ones are neutrophils. And then this is showing the lamina propria tongues, which are or papillae as we call them. And these are going up, as you can see in the thickness. This is the upper one third, and these have reached the upper one third, whereas they should not have been above, say, somewhere here in the normal. And of course, there is basal cell hyperplasia. So inflammatory cells, basal cell hyperplasia, superficial subepithelial lamina propria papillae are all indicative of gastroesophageal reflux disease with esophagitis. Differential diagnosis is, of course, infectious, pill esophagitis, corrosive injury, radiation, other systemic diseases. In all of these, the appropriate clinical history will help. Uh, most of these are, in fact, a little more severe than uh, reflux esophagitis is commonly is. But of course, reflux esophagitis can be very severe even with ulcers. So a clinical history is very important. And also biopsy from any superficial exudate material is important, especially to pick up infectious esophagitis. Pitfalls. 
because there is epithelial hyperplasia and inflammation and reactive epithelial hyperplasia can be a lot. And that can give rise to something that we call pseudo epitheliomatous hyperplasia or pseudo carcinomatous hyperplasia. This needs to be differentiated from squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, that is, of course, for the pathologist to do. There is no invasion. There is no desmoplastic, that is a fibrous sort of reaction in the stroma whenever there is an invasive carcinoma. And there is no cytoarchitectural pleomorphism. So as you can see over here, this is showing a lot of tongues of squamous epithelium, huh? infiltrating into what lo looks like it's pushing into the underlying subepithelium. But these are all very bland and benign looking with the normal, you know, sort of pattern of basal cells and then the stratum spongiosum, etc. So here, this is not, uh, there is no desmoplastic or fibrous reaction in the underlying stroma, no invasion. These are just continuous tongues of this epithelium. So this is hyperplasia. This is not squamous cell carcinoma. Eosinophilic esophagitis, another interesting and coming up a little more these days in our acquisition forms. Poll question five, please. Number of eosinophils to diagnose eosinophilic esophagitis. Excellent. So there are more than 15 eosinophils are required to make a diagnosis of eosinophilic es esophagitis. And most of you, more than 80% have got the correct diagnosis, although this is more a pathology question, <laughs> but I'm glad to see more people have got this correct. So eosinophilic esophagitis by definition is a clinical pathological diagnosis. The uh, it is characterized by uh, symptoms in the uh, upper GI tract and more than 15 eosinophils per high power field at any level of the esophagus, upper, mid or lower. And these are intraepithelial lymphocytes, not in the lamina propria, they are within the epithelium. So this is usually a chronic immunoantigen mediated disorder. And the symptoms are more of esophageal dysfunction like dysphagia, etc. And uh, histologically, there is the eosinophilic predominant infiltration. Important point to note is you call it eosinophilic eosophagitis when you know that there is no other cause for that eosinophilia. For example, a parasitic infect infestation. And then it's also important to note that causatively it is distinct from GERD, whereas GERD is usually more due to acid or biliary reflux and other conditions. Eosinophilic esophagitis is an immune-mediated condition. So this is causatively very different from GERD. Uh, it is a patchy disease. Therefore, it is important that multiple biopsies should be taken from the mid, proximal, and distal esophagus, all three sites. And it is in fact in the mid esophagus that we find maximum pickup of eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, but if there is any area of exudate, a lot of eosinophils will be present there. So definitely take a sample from that area. And it is useful to take a sample from the duodenum and uh, gastric mucosa to rule out an eosinophilic gastroenteritis. Now, this is an example of a case where these small eosinophils, all in the intraepithelial location, bright eosinophilic granular cytoplasm they have. You see them within the epithelium. And in the epithelium, you can see they are causing these little areas of cystic degeneration forming abscesses. Another high power view showing these um, eosinophils that are present and forming these little microabscesses. And this is a biopsy sample from the exudate of the same patient, wherein you can see a lot of these eosinophils in the exudate. So we do have to count them, but when you see these eosinophilic microabscesses and the exudate, you're pretty sure you're dealing with eosinophilic esophagitis. Diagnostic criteria I've already told you. Uh, now, what are the other infectious and inflammatory lesions? They include biops uh, 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 what is the biopsy strategy for these other infectious and inflammatory lesions? You must include biopsies of ulcers along with the ulcer edge. You must include sample of exudates, especially to pick up uh, organisms. And if there is a bullous lesion that you are suspecting, 
ask your pathology department to send you immunofluorescence material in a while and you take one biopsy piece in that immunofluorescence medium and the rest you send in the regular 10% neutral buffer formula. So this is an example of pemphigus vulgaris, which is a bullous lesion. So the superficial part is not seen. What we're seeing is the basal part. Here, the blister was present. And plus, in addition, you see some inflammatory cells. And if you do an immunofluorescence, you see this typical fishnet immunofluorescence pattern that is seen with IgG or C3 in uh, pemphigus vulgaris. Poll question six, please. So intranuclear cowdery A-type inclusion bodies are seen in which condition? Okay, so typically cowdery A type are a nomenclature we typically give to herpes simplex virus infection. Yes, sometimes some people do mention it in cytomegalo, but they are typically that uh, morphology is seen in herpes simplex type of virus infection. So herpes esophagitis is another thing that we come across sometimes, especially in immunocompromised individuals. If they're uh, <clears throat> having HIV or uh, uh, undergoing some chemotherapy, usually it's due to HSV1, 2 is very rare. And the most common site in the GI tract for herpes simplex, in fact, is the esophagus. Histologically, what we see is these classical two types of inclusions. One are these ground glass inclusions, like a glassy eosinophilic inclusion within the nucleus. And the second are these characteristic cowdery A dark inclusions in the nucleus with a clear halo around them. These are the cowdery A type of inclusions. And in addition, you see some multinucleate giant cells. Now, whenever we see multinuclear giant cells, because that is easier to pick up on low power, we definitely go to high power to look for the ground glass or a cowdery type of inclusions. And it is in a background of mononuclear inflammation. And if there is any doubt, one can do a immunohistochemical stain for herpes simplex virus and this, uh, make a confirmatory diagnosis. Type 1 and 2 are not distinguished on histology. And um, most of the cases are due to type 1. Now let's have a look at candida infestation. Uh, now, since candida is part of the normal microbiota flora of the GI tract, it's usually seen this fungal infection if there is an immunosuppressed patient. The most common type is candida albicans or tropicalis. These are budding yeast and pseudo -hyphae. So what you need for the diagnosis is not just to see candida buds but you must see the budding yeast form or the pseudo hyphae, which means that these are growing there. They are not just present as a commensal and in a background of active esophagitis. In, uh, if there is no inflammation, be very uh, you know, cautious of saying that this is candidiasis. You may have picked up a few spores of candida, but it may not be candidiasis. We use special stains like silver or PAS to diagnose fungal infections. This is a, a PS stain where you can pick up much better than HNE the candida. These are the pseudo hyphae. So these are just the budding yeast forms which have gotten a little elongated and arranged in an end on manner, um, you know, tail to toe. And therefore they look like hyphae. But these are not hyphae, these are just budding yeasts. And these are all the spore forms. And if you can see the background, all these cells are inflammatory cells. So in an inflammatory background, we have these budding yeast forms. Of course, you need to also differentiate from less common infections like aspergillus, where you have true uh, a hyphae with acute angle branching, true branching hyphae, and histoplasma, wherein they, these are smaller organisms which are usually present within the macrophage. So these uh, can be distinguished. Now coming to the big uh, topic of Barrett's esophagus, where it, wherein this is columnar metaplasia of the esophagus, as you all know. 
two things required for diagnosis. A, it should be visible endoscopically. You should see that salmon pink mucosa. B, it must be confirmed histologically. First described in 1957 by Dr. Norman Barrett, who saw this uh, columnar reticulium. And we classify it typically as two types, long and short. And of course, some people call, they have an ultra short segment also. Long is when it's more than three centimeters above the G junction being involved and less than that is short segment. Now, as far as a histological perspective is concerned, there is a difference in the American and British guidelines. When you see salmon pink mucosa, which you confirm is columna metaplasia, and it is more than one centimeter from the GE junction, you can say that it is short or long segment, depending on where you are, of Barrett's esophagus. But the American guideline says goblet cells should be present, not just columna, and the British guidelines say that just columna cells are enough, goblet cells are not required. We more commonly, frankly, follow the American guidelines. <clears throat> Poll question seven, please. So what is the special stain to identify Barrett's epithelium? Is it a trichrome, a crystal violet, a PS algin blue, or a tolerable? A lot of people have not yet answered, but uh, in, the, in order to save time, I think I'll just go ahead. So more than 50% of those who have answered have said that it is PS algin blue, which is the correct answer. Mason's trichrome is for fibrous tissue and muscle, so that is used much more in the liver. Crystal violet is not uh, used for this at all. It is a magenta colored stain, but it does not show these mucins. And tolvidine blue also is a metachromatic stain, but it is used for other conditions, including mast cells, and not for differentiating these different types of mucin. Typically for that, we use PS algin blue. So this is a etchy uh, picture of uh, Barrett's esophagus. This is easy to diagnose because in this particular case, because here you've got the squamous epithelium on both sides and a bit of the glandular epithelium in between, and it is showing presence of goblet cells. And uh, of course, if your clinician has said the biopsy is more than one centimeter above the G junction, you're sure that this is short or long segment, Barrett's mucosa. Usually Barrett's mucosa has this superficial part where goblet cells are more common and the deeper part where, where you often see goblet cells, but you may just see glandular type of mucosa, uh, columnar mucosa. Now, this is a PS algin blue staining, where you can see that the stomach shows normal uh, neutral mucin. And here also you can see the normal neutral mucin because it is a mixture of uh, the two types of epithelium. And you also see the presence of these goblet cells. So goblet cells will never have neutral mucin. They always have acid mucin. So if you see something that looks like a goblet cell and has neutral mucin, that's a pseudo uh, a goblet cell and that is not a true goblet cell and that does not make a diagnosis of Barrett's uh, if you are following the American system of classification. Another stain that can be used is the HIV algin blue stain, which we use more commonly when we're talking about intestinal metaphase in the stomach. We don't often use it. It distinguishes the mucin in the goblet cells and columna cells as silomucin and sulfomucin. The blue is silo, which is more common in the small intestine, and the brown is sulfo, which is more common in the large intestine. So coming back to Barrett's, what should be the biopsy strategy? Four quadrant biopsies every two centimeters of columnar lined mucosa, especially when you're looking for dysplasia. Additional sampling of any abnormal area, do not sample from an area that's less than one centimeter from the G junction, and the requisition form must contain details of what you have biopsied. Have you biopsied an endoscopically visible area? What distance was it? That is important to the pathologist to be able to give you a correct diagnosis and to be able to uh, inform you if there is any 
uh, dysplasia in case you have taken it from any area where you are suspecting that. So the detection rate increases if the number of endoscopic biopsies are there, more number of biopsies, more the detection, that's almost you know, obvious. And the longer the segment of metaplastic, that salmon pink mucosa that you see, the greater the chances of detection. So uh, multiple biopsies must be taken. Now, important to note is that the highest number of biopsies should be taken from the most proximal part of this salmon pink mucosa, because that is where the detection rate is likely to be more. Now, when we're talking about dysplasia, uh, you all are familiar with the Prague protocol, etc. So if you are following a particular protocol of um, biopsies and identifying the type of Barrett's esophagus, then the detection rate is usually higher, especially, uh, uh, and the other reason when the detection rate is higher is the longer the segment of Barrett's esophagus. So it is good, especially when the esophageal segment is not that long uh, the, to follow a particular protocol of biopsies because then that definitely increases your detection rate not just of Barrett's but also of dysplasia in the segment of Barrett's which is very important. Now how does a pathology report sign out? Columnar line mucosa with native esophageal structure so squamous epithelium is there and intestinal metaplasia with goblet cells we have no problem in calling it diagnostic for Barrett's esophagus. If we are not seeing the native squamous epithelium, just columnar line mucosa with intestinal metaplasia, then we say that it is probably Barrett's if you have taken a biopsy more than one centimeter above the G junction. If the biopsy is closer to the G junction, it may well be intestinal metaplasia at the cardiac end of the stomach. And therefore, that should be left for a clinical correlation unless you have mentioned the site of the biopsy on the form, which is why it is very important to mention the site of biopsy on the form. If we see only glandular epithelium but no intestinal metaplasia, then in the British guidelines, you can say that it may be consistent with uh, Barrett's, but we usually do not sign it out as such, and we usually say that this is um, in keeping with but not diagnostic of Barrett's. And so we may ask for more uh, biopsy samples. And squamous mucosa only is, of course, there is no evidence of Barrett's. Why is this important? Because the risk of malignancy in Barrett's is more than in just metaplastic columnar line esophagus, which is also more than in the general population. The risk is more in long than short segment Barrett's. The risk is more in Barrett's than in intestinal metaplasia at the GE junction or at the gastric cardia. So therefore, it is important to know where we have taken the biopsy from and where is this metaplastic change present. This is an example of dysplasia. So if we see just this type of dysplasia with, uh, you know, uh, now the goblet cells are no longer present, the nuclei are uh, elongated, they are having higher NC ratio, these cells, they are crowded, they are overlapping, pseudostratification, but just this much as in the one that I am circling with my pointer, then this could just be low-grade dysplasia. But the moment you see a lot of these nuclei reaching the surface of the lumen and these little papillary projections within the lumen, presence of necrosis, this is now high-grade dysplasia or even an in-situ carcinoma. And the implications of both are very different. Uh, sometimes it is helpful to use a P53 stain. So now the wild type P53 does not show much staining or shows a few scattered random cells picking up the stain in the nucleus. Now, when there is P53 mutation, then what happens is the all the cells of, with P53 mutation, they start staining positively in the nucleus. And that this is seen in uh, high-grade dysplasia. So if there is high-grade dysplasia in the esophagus Barrett's epithelium, then you will see P53 staining and therefore this forms a good adjunct to um, the routine HNE stain to be able to pick up high-grade dysplasia areas. Negative staining does not rule out high-grade dysplasia. So you're, our h &E stain has prime importance, but P53 stain is a good adjunct to use. And usually if P53 is positive and it's still high-grade dysplasia without invasion, the risk of invasive adenocarcinoma is higher in these cases. Now, neoplastic conditions of the esophagus, um, 
We've already discussed Barrett's, then there's squamous papillomas, which are benign, and then of course the usual squamous and uh, adenocarcinoma. Neuroendocrine, I'll discuss in the end with uh, the stomach. So squamous papilloma is a benign proliferative lesion of the squamous epithelium, which could be exophytic, cauliflower-like, or endophytic. And it is usually associated with HPV infection. But this HPV infection, there are various genotypes of HPV. And the types that cause a papilloma are type 6 and 11, which are very different from the types that cause a carcinoma. So a squamous cell carcinoma is called by HPV type 16 and 18. Besides, of course, this is not necessarily that common in uh, the esophagus. It's more common in, say, the cervix. But besides these, of course, there are various other risk factors like tobacco smoke, nitrates, alcohol, ecclesia, etc. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and uh, P53 and EGFR mutations are also uh, uh, seen in squamous cell carcinoma. This usually... Precursors are low-grade or high-grade dysplasia, and you can have an in-situ carcinoma. And morphologically, grossly, as you all know, you usually see an exophytic, fungating, ulcerative, or infiltrated. Now, as I said, you can just have high-grade dysplasia without invasion. So there may be full thickness dysplasia. That means that these cells that are looking atypical with uh, uh, increased mitotic activity, even present at the surface, not just in the basal zone, high NC ratio, pleomorphism, they are present throughout. There is no area which is showing the normal graded morphology of the squamous epithelium. Now, this is high-grade dysplasia or full thickness or squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Whereas once it invades underlying epithelium, uh, sorry, lamina propria, even the muscularis, mucosae, submucosa, then it is squamous cell carcinoma. <clears throat> P63 stain can be used. Now, P63 stain, very often we are given a record, okay, can you please confirm by IHC? Now, IHC is not going to confirm to me whether it's an invasive carcinoma or not. That only tells me that, yes, it's a squamous cell carcinoma and therefore is helpful if I want, if, if the carcinoma is in the lower part of the esophagus, then I want to make sure, yes, I'm dealing with the squamous cell carcinoma. There's no chance that it's a adenocarcinoma or a mixed adenosquamous carcinoma. Then P63, CK56, etc. will help. And these are negative for CK7 and 20, which are more seen in adenocarcinomas. So the normal epithelium, whether dysplastic or normal, and the tumor will both show this. So this does not help to make a diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma. It only helps in confirming that it's squamous and not adeno. And therefore, more helpful if there's any morphological doubt or if the biopsies in the lower one third are not very well differentiated. In a well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, no need to do these IHC stains. Sometimes they can even be keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma. Again, no problem in making the diagnosis. Then sometimes we have a variant called basal oil squamous cell carcinoma, more in the, um, uh, in the GIT that is more common, obviously, in the uh, uh, esophagus or then in the anal canal, and usually seen in older men. And this, again, can be seen in fact, sometimes in the middle and distal esophagus, and therefore we have to confirm using the special stains. Now, what happens is these cells are usually similar to the basal cells of the normal squamous epithelium, so they are cuboidal to columna with high NC ratio, small cells. They are not large cells like the cells of a squamous cell carcinoma. Mitosis is very high, and they can have an NC2 component or be invasive just like a regular SCC. So this is an example wherein we see these basal cells, normal ones, and here these cells that are infiltrating, and I'll show you a high power view, all have the same morphology of a basal cell, uh, of the basal cells of the normal epithelium. This is invasive. You can see the desmoplastic stroma, higher power view. These are all small cuboidal columnar cells with very high MC ratio, less cytoplasm. And these, we can confirm, they will be P63 positive like SCC, but in addition, they show CK19 and CK14 immunoreactivity, and they usually have a worse prognosis. So it is important to be able to pick up these and confirm by IHC and give the correct diagnosis in such cases. 
So this is a CK19 stain, which will not be positive in the routine SCC. It will only be positive in positivity in these nests or trabeculae of tumor cells. Now, adenocarcinoma, more than 95% develop in association with Barrett's. Risk factors can include tobacco use, obesity, GERD, other than Barrett's. So they have higher chance. Then tumor suppressor proteins like P53, P16, P27 and other mutations may be present. The types it may have the usual tubuloglandular type. It can have a papillary type. It can have a mucinous type where there are pools of mucin with uh, floating tumor cells within that. It can have a signet ring cell type. So these are the types that you see carcinomas anywhere in the GIT. And these are the types that can be seen in the esophagus as well. Here, we do often need to confirm the diagnosis. So P63, as you can see here, will be negative. Whereas cytokeratin 7, which is a stain for the upper GI tract, will be positive. In addition, a carcinoembryonic antigen stain can be done that is often positive. But CK7 is usually a good stain to do for this. And CDX2 can also be positive. Now, sometimes the patient has received um, neoadjuvant therapy. And then the biopsy may just show stub inflammation and plus minus tumor cells. In such cases, it's important for us to do a simple cytokeratin stain to pick up the tumor cells. And based on the amount of tumor that we, uh, we see, we can grade the carcinoma. However, I won't go into details of this because this is usually left for resections after neoadjuvant therapy rather than for a biopsy. In a biopsy, we can only tell you whether we are seeing any tumor cells or not. And of course, we will tell you the quantity of tumor cells, but ideally these gradings are not to be done in a biopsy. Now, another, now let, moving on to some of the mesenchymal tumors. Another tumor that is not common, but in the GI tract, it is most common in the esophagus, is uh, a granular cell tumor. This is a tumor of Schwann cells in adults, more common in women than men, usually asymptomatic or picked up, you know, just when you're doing um, uh, endoscopy for some other reason, but sometimes it can cause dysphagia. Small, usually small in size. This is one of our cases, small little tumor and maybe an EMR or something can uh, resect most of the tumor. Sheets and nests of rounded polygonal cells with small uh, nuclei and abundant eosinophilic granular cytoplasm is the histological hallmark. And these cells are sub-epithelial in location. It's not an epithelial tumor, it's a mesenchymal tumor. And these granules are usually red when we do a PAS stain. So this uh, is the typical morphology, large cells, polygonal cells, smaller nuclei, so NC ratio is not high. And abundant granular eosinophilic cytoplasm. And immunohistochemically, a lot of stains may come positive variably, but what stain often uniformly comes positive is S100. So with the characteristic morphology and an S100 stain showing positivity of these large cells in the subepithelium, it is simple to make a diagnosis of a granular cell tumor. Usually a benign lesion, malignant is very rare. The other tumor is leomyoma. Leomyoma is more common than gist in the stomach. Uh, GIST is more common in the stomach. Leomyoma is more common in the esophagus. We can get multiple seedling leomyomas, small, small leomyomas. For example, this one here. And so these, when they are resected they, uh, by EMR, you see the classical pattern of elongated cells arranged in bundles and whorls. In hypa, you can see these with oval nuclei. And then when you do an immunostain for smooth muscles, such as smooth muscle actin, desmin, calponin, or caldesmon, these will be positive, usually benign with low mitotic activity. Now, uh, we'll come to the gastric. In case you want to take a little break over here uh, for some question answers, then the moderators can guide me. Otherwise, I go on with the gastric.
so uh, there is no question when in chat box so i should ask you question uh um, uh, you have told that uh, we should take the biopsy from the abnormal mucosa and in and around normal cardia and normal esophagus also. So in that case, uh, number of biopsy specimen that bottle will increase. And we know pathologists are very busy and uh, difficult and so to get them. Uh, so really, in practically, we should send in different bottle or. Uh, what See, should uh, you take on for the Indian population, ma'am? Yeah. So, um, see, even if the pathologist is busy, we have to keep the patient in mind first. And uh, the, when you're taking biopsies, say, from the esophagus for eosinophilic esophagitis or for uh, GERD, then it is good enough to put them in one bottle. But when you're taking it from the G-junction or the cardia, now those have to be put in separate bottles and labeled separately. So because that you cannot mix everything and make one, you know, little palau in the thing that makes it difficult to interpret. So that is not a good idea. That must not be done. But uh, uh, if you see that everything else is totally normal and you don't want to take other biopsies, then it would be a good idea to at least mention in your uh, requisition form that no biopsy is taken from these areas and they look endoscopically normal. The ideal scenario, of course, is that you take adequate biopsies from the area, uh, uh, you know, like in GERD, more than two centimeters or in eosinophilic esophagitis from all the segments of the esophagus. Those can be clubbed together in one bottle. That is not a problem. But from other areas, they should be in separately labeled bottles. Another question is in chat box from Dr. Patel. So low-grade versus high-grade dysplasia. Any criteria or is it subjective to pathologists? Uh, see, um, it's not subjective to a pathologist. Yes, if you start doing inter and intra observer variations, you might find some differences as you would find even in any clinical condition. Uh, when there is nuclear pseudostratification, crowding, and loss of the normal um, columnar type of mucosa uh, and fewer goblet cells now, rather you are seeing those cells, but the cells are not looking too pleomorphic and there is no necrosis and they are not reaching the luminal aspect of that gland, crypt, glandular uh, morphology. Then that is low-grade dysplasia. Once there is a luminal aspect, once there is a lot of pleomorphism, prominent nucleoli, presence of necrosis, then it is high-grade dysplasia. So yes, there are criteria. And P53 reactivity more likely in high-grade dysplasia. So, uh, Pooja, this is Dr. Shobna Bhatia. Right. So, Uja, uh, just one more question in the same way. Is that uh, how do you differentiate uh, mild dysplasia from an inflammatory lesion? Because that's where the confusion is. That's and a dysplasia, it is said that you need at least two trained pathologists to be able to confirm mild dysplasia before you give away this report. So, yes. just a little comment on that, please. That's a very good question, ma'am. So, uh, when there is a lot of inflammation, there is reactive atypia, what we call, right? So that reactive atypia has to be differentiated from uh, dysplasia. Now, when there is reactive atypia, A, if you are seeing inflammatory cells going into the crypt in question, then one must be very wary in making the diagnosis of dysplasia. Then it is more likely to be reactive atypia, unless the amount of atypia in that crypt is so much, you know, like a high-grade dysplasia or more than you would expect to see with an inflammatory atypia. Then you can say that it is dysplastic change. Secondly, you can look at the mitotic activity or do a KI-67 stain. Even in reactive atypia, usually uh, the MIB-1 immunoreactivity is not, um, uh, you know, occupying all parts of the crypt epithelium, the glandular epithelium, more in the base. So that morphological pattern also helps in uh, making your diagnosis. And if at the end of this, the pathologist is not sure which happens, then it is not a good idea to say it is dysplastic because it impacts the treatment. It is a good idea 
to say that I am not sure, it is indefinite for dysplasia, let the biopsy be repeated, let the patient be on a short term follow up and the repeat biopsy be done. Because the implication of that will be much more severe. Correct. I agree with that. Okay. Another there, question. In the chat, is there one more question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, so now, ma'am, another question is there. So it is from Dr. Neha. Clear cell changes present in squamous cell carcinoma of esophagus. Point to level as signet ring variant of squamous cell carcinoma? Any diagnostic criteria? See, um, sorry. So, signet ring variant of squamous cell carcinoma, A, it's very unusual. Secondly, at that time, you must be able to see signet rings. So, you, you must see the cells that are having a rounded morphology now, not polygonal, and that the nucleus is pushed to the periphery. Uh, only then is it becoming a signet ring uh, morphology. And it is very rare. So that is something that one should be careful about. We're not talking about signet ring adenocarcinoma. You see, now you're saying signet ring variant in a squamous cell carcinoma. So here you have to be very wary. It is not common. And secondly, you must make sure that you are getting the proper signet ring morphology in a fair number of cells. Now, I don't think there are any specific diagnostic criteria as we have for signet ring cell carcinoma in adenocarcinoma, but it should be present in a fair number of cells. So I would say that maybe the same 50% or whatever, but since it's very rare, this is not commonly, does not commonly come up. Since no question in chat first, man, we should proceed on. And uh, I will uh, encourage our audience to put uh, their question in the chat box so that we can oh. and discuss and it. So now, uh, quickly, I think I'm trying to uh, the non-neoplastic and inflammatory lesions of the stomach. So the stomach will, uh, antrum and fundus is clearly different. I showed that to you earlier. But if there is atrophic gastritis, it can look similar. So what are the biopsies that we receive and in one while? That is the way it is normally done. Those are the fab five biopsies. So if you always follow the same protocol, then it makes life easier for the pathologist. In fact, it does not increase our work because I know I expect to see these five biopsies in that while. So if I see something amiss, then I know there is some pathology there. So if you do not follow that protocol, then you must inform the pathologist where the biopsies have been taken from. So the FAB5 biopsies are usually two from the body, from lesser and greater curvature, one each, one from the incisura in angularis, and two from the pylorus, which is, I think this has shifted a bit my those circles at this side, and two from the pylorus, again, one from lesser, one from greater curvature, from the antrum. So it is important to uh, take these five biopsies as that would cover conditions that are more commonly in the gastric body and conditions that are more commonly in the antrum as we'll see as we go ahead. So <clears throat> these can be placed in the same bottle as I said, but if there is an ulcer, a mass, a polyp, something else, then that should be placed in a separate bottle and labeled separately. If there is an ulcer, the edge biopsy must be taken because the main ulcer may only show exudate on some infection material if it is there. So the ulcer edge biopsy, if they're looking for malignancy or the etiology of the ulcer, must be taken separately as well. Now, these should be labeled separately. The FAB5 can go in one bottle. Other important information in the requisition form is, especially when you're looking for helicobacter, has the patient been previously treated? Has he been treated for H. pylori or has he or she been treated with PPI? Now, helicobacter pylori is difficult to see on HME. So if you are expecting it, then definitely mention it so that that lab will do the appropriate special stains also. Some labs like ours do it for every case, but many labs may want to save on extra sections and uh, you know stains and the work of the technicians. And therefore, they want to do it only on select cases. 
Then PPI therapy, it changes the morphology and location of the organism from luminal to intracellular, from spiral form, as I'll tell you later, to copacillary form. So you must inform of the treatment that has been given to the patient. Poll question eight, sorry. Poll question eight. Can you please share the poll question? So which special stain is done to identify H. pylori? Is it immunohistochemistry, Wardenstari, modified GIMSA, or all of the above? So 50% um, have chosen all of the above, which is actually the correct answer. Both Wharton Starry and modified GIMSA will stain it. GIMSA modified is a easier stain to do. So it is more commonly done. In fact, immunohistochemistry can be used if required, but is not cost effective and is not routinely done unless you, know, you really need to. So uh, H. pylori gastritis, first described as you all know in 1982, also called Campylobacter pylori. It is gram negative, so we don't use gram stain to stain it usually. It is a flagellate cocobacillus. So it usually has 2.5 spirals and can be present even in the cocobacillary form. The characteristic form where we pick it up diagnostically is when it is present as a 2.5 spiral flagella. Uh, atrophic gastritis or diffuse antral gastritis or type B gastritis is the common lesion associated with it. In addition, it can be a uh, cause for mort lymphoma or adenocarcinoma. So if you see these conditions, you can look for H. pylori in the adjacent normal mucosa. Now this is a h &E and a modified GIMSA stain. On h &E, as you can see, these are paler and more difficult to pick up in these places, but an experienced pathologist or can pick them up even on h &E, but if the clinical index of suspicion is high and I'm not seeing them, and especially, you know, when the density of the organism is low, then you may not pick it up that easily on h &E, then a GIMSA stain will help. Of course, what I'm showing you is very high density, but it's not always uh, so high. You have to pick up even if there are two, three organisms uh, with a GIMSA stain, you should be able to pick it up. What it's commonly associated with is inflammatory cells, neutrophils in the lamina propria and infiltrating the epithelium, which in large intestine, as you know, we call cryptitis. In the stomach, we call it pititis, since these are gastric pits and pit abscesses. So pititis and pit abscesses are commonly seen as are lymphoid aggregates. So if you see these, these should raise the index of suspicion for you to really look carefully for and get a special stain done to rule out the presence of H. pylori gastritis. If uh, they are more commonly found in the antrum. However, if PPI treatment is given, then they move up to the body mucosa. I know most people have been given PPI treatment by the time they reach you and you do an endoscopic biopsy. So therefore the Fab 5 become important because even if it's present in the body mucosa, we will be able to pick it up. Often associated with epithelial degeneration, cryptitis, etc. as I told you, it can be associated with intestinal metaplasia. I mean, that can happen with this gastritis that occurs, but in the area of metaplasia, you will not find H. pylori. So the pathologist must screen in the other areas, not in the area of metaplasia. And usually they are found on the cell surface, uh, maybe adherent or in the mucin uh, above the cell surface. But if, if with treatment, then sometimes they move intracellularly and cocobacillary forms may be, which may be more common, in which case a pathologist usually just says that we've seen these forms. It's not diagnostic of H. pylori, but it may be consistent with. Now, atrophic gastritis. What is atrophic gastritis? When there is a gastritis, that is, there's inflammation, there may be pititis, abscesses, varying grades of gastritis, but in addition, there is loss of glands. So the glands become fewer in number, with or without metaplasia. So chronic inflammation and loss of glands is there, with or without metaplasia. It can be in the setting of H. pylori infection or in autoimmune gastritis. So we've already covered H. pylori infection, which is one type, 
more common. And then of course, there is the autoimmune gastritis. Regardless of the etiology, the diagnosis of atrophic gastritis should be confirmed by histopathology if the clinician is suspecting it on um, endoscopy. So it may or may not be associated with H. pylori, but the more severe the loss of glands, this is a diagrammatic representation. So this is normal, a lot of glands, whether it's antrum or body. And as the atrophy increases, the number of glands in the deep glandular zone, mind you, the superficial glands remain the same. But in the deep glandular zone, the number of glands decrease. So therefore, the antrum and body start even resembling each other a bit. It becomes difficult to distinguish. The number of inflammatory cells will concomitantly increase. If you're associated with H. pylori, usually the number of bacilli will also concomitantly increase. And if associated with metaplasia, then that is also something that you need to be able to pick up. So what is intestinal metaplasia? As I told you earlier in Barrett's, that is also a form of intestinal metaplasia. Similarly, in the stomach, if we see this is the normal superficial glandular zone that we have seen earlier, right? The tall columnar mucin secreting cells. But if you start seeing goblet cells, then that is presence of intestinal metaplasia in the stomach, more common in the antrum, but can be seen in the body as well, uh, different and different etiologies. So in type B gastritis associated with H. pylori, you'd see intestinal metaplasia more in the antral mucosa, whereas in autoimmune, which I'll show you later, you'll see more in the body mucosa. The metaplasia can be complete, whereas in resembles small intestine mucosa with some brush border and some normal uh, gastric type of glands and these goblet cells. This is the right-hand picture. The left-hand picture shows a mixture of mucins along with goblet cells. Now, this is a picture of incomplete intestinal metaplasia. And if sulfomucins, which I showed you earlier, are more in its incomplete and therefore nowadays people do not necessarily do the HIV so what is type A gastritis? It is non-infectious, not associated with H. pylori. It is immune mediated, corpus predominant. So in the body mucosa. And here there is progressive destruction of the auxintic mucosa. So more often associated with atrophic gastritis. Therefore it leads to pernicious anemia. So, the autoimmune gastritis does not rule out H. pylori infection. You must look for both. Intestinal metaplasia here is more common in the body, and pure autoimmune gastritis is antral sparing, more in the body mucosa. But if you see inflammation all over, then it may show uh, it may be just H. pylori or autoimmune with H. pylori as well. So this is an example of uh, gastritis where there's a lot of inflammation and some paucity of glands. But why I'm showing you this low pi, you'll not be able to appreciate. But now in high pi, you can see there is paucity of the normal glands. A lot of inflammation, including some lymphoid aggregates. But what I'm drawing your attention to, when there is atrophic gastritis, especially autoimmune, or when there is a prolonged PPI therapy, what a pathologist must look for is also the presence of these nests of endocrine cells depicting endocrine cell hyperplasia. So these are just few that I've circled in black. These are nests of endocrine cells, which is endocrine cell hyperplasia that can accompany the autoimmune gastritis. So on the lower right, I showed you what you see in antral mucosa, mind you. Whereas this is part of the body mucosa more commonly, but can be seen in the antrum, where you see a band-like endocrine cells on synaptopycin stain, but they are um, scattered in the crypt. Whereas here, the entire crypt appears to be composed of this sort of uh, endocrine cells. And you can even see linear bands of endocrine cells. Then this is endocrine cell hyperplasia, which must be mentioned to the clinician.
So these bands can be of various types. It can be diffuse, uh, the endocrine cell hyperplasia, linear, micronodular, or even adenomatoid. And sometimes these may be considered as a precursor to development of neuroendocrine tumors. So this must be, uh, note must be mentioned in your report. Now coming to the other infections. So if I don't see H. pylori, there's a lot of infection. I must look for some other infections if I find. Often we don't, but if I find. So therefore, one of those is cryptosporidiosis, where you see these small organisms adherent to the surface of the gastric pit. And it's a high power view. These are typically attached to the surface mucosa. And these can also be picked up on GEMSA, which you use for your H. pylori. And therefore, it's useful to look at the gastric pits and the surface especially. And this is cryptosporidiosis. And uh, <clears throat> this also is associated with inflammation. And more common, however, in immunocompromised patients. So if that history you've got, then definitely look carefully for that. Then erosive gastro gastritis. So when there's a lot of ulcer and erosion, there could be various reasons for that, including H. pylori. One of the things that pathologists must look carefully for is iron pill gastritis. Now, other pills like NSAIDs may show a similar picture, but what do they, they do not show is the presence of this brownish uh, substance adherent to the exudate and the superficial mucosa. And this is usually due to iron pill. They may just show the same form of an erosive ulcerative gastritis. And when we do a pearl stain, we can see the presence of this iron adherent to the surface epithelium and in the mucosa, which is iron pill gastritis. More often than not, this history is not present in the R requisition form. So pathologists must look for it carefully. And if we see this and stain for it, we go back and take a history from the patient. They are usually taking iron pills. <clears throat> Granulomatous gastritis. Uh, is of course just the presence of granuloma in the stomach. In our country, most common condition is tuberculosis. The other condition which our uh, clinician often wants to know is, is could it be Crohn's? And the sarcoidosis, foreign body. Now that I'm sure has been discussed in the previous lectures on large intestine and Crohn's uh, uh, disease and IBD. So I won't go into that. You just see these granulomas. If you see typical caseous necrosis, it's more likely to be tuberculosis, Langhans giant cell, and of course, acid fast bacilli, not found very commonly, but the more number of man hours a pathologist spends on finding it, believe me, a pathologist can then find it. But a typical caseous necrosis, large granuloma, Langhans giant cell, more likely to be tuberculosis than Crohn's. Eosinophilic gastritis, when more than 30 eosinophils are present per high power field then it is called eosinophilic gastritis. And that is, these are present in the lamina propria. Unlike uh, the esophagus uh, where we were talking about, present intraepithelially. Now here they are present in the lamina propria. And you must see them in at least five high power fields that the colleges must see before, not just one little focal area. But therefore it is important that multiple biopsies are taken. So when there is enough tissue pieces and you're seeing it in enough areas, you are more sure of calling it eosinophilic gastritis. If there are fewer tissue pieces and you see it in one or two areas only, then the pathologist is unsure now whether should I label it or not. So the report will then just be given as these are present and you may or may not call it eosinophilic, you have to correlate. Of course, um, eosinophilic gastritis, to label it as a idiopathic or de novo eosinophilic gastritis, you have to rule out other known causes of mucosal eosinophilia, including parasitic infestation, of course. Lymphocytic gastritis, again, usually as in lymphocytic colitis, but I'm not going to go into details. Only important thing here to remember is this can occur. We usually see intraepithelial lymphocytes of T cell type, more than 25 per 100 epithelial cells. And you can see similar morphology in other conditions such as H. pylori, Crohn's associated with celiac disease, especially in the antral mucosa. But if you do not have any of these associations, then you can call it lymphocytic gastritis. And lymphocytic gastritis, of course, as lymphocytic colitis also, can be associated with celiac disease as well. 
Now, GAVE is another reason why we are often given a biopsy. Of course, endoscopically, typically, there is that watermelon stomach appearance, but often we, the you know findings are probably not so sure. We, so we do get a biopsy saying, is it GAVE or not? Wherein a pathologist has to look for three important findings. One is that the surface epithelium is no longer looking that healthy, tall columnar cells. Instead, it is looking like there's some regeneration and atypia and regenerative gastropathy sort of thing going on. In a patient, superficial capillaries are congested and we see fibrin thrombi. And the third thing is we see this fibromuscular hyperplasia, which is coming up into the superficial uh, mucosa rather than staying at the base like you normally see in the uh, muscularis mucosa. So when we see these features, then these are consistent with a diagnosis of gain. Now coming to gastric tumors, polyps, I'm not going to go into the detail of so many polyps obviously, but uh, a lot of them are common to the polyps that you see in other parts of the intestine. So there's no need to go into detail. I'll just talk about two polyps that are more common here. One is the hyperplastic polyp, which similar to what you see in the large intestine. So you see serrated architecture. And what is important to note is that in the stomach, you may not be able to see that serrated architecture. Then what we see is these star-shaped lumina. And they're actually very common polyps in the stomach. They are small, and therefore, what I believe is that if a small polyp a clinician is suspecting a hyperplastic polyp, you may or may not even remove it. I'm not sure that you can tell me better, but these are common polyps, usually small in size, though. And these hyperplastic polyps have star shaped lumina and are composed of the superficial foveolar mucosa. So, in contrast, we have the fundic gland polyps. And these pandic gland polyps usually show polypoid proliferations with these cystically dilated uh, glands. And these dilated glands can be lined partly by the uh, uh, superficial foveolar type of mucosa, but more commonly are lined by flattened parietal and chief cells, that is the specialized type of mucosa. As the name implies, they are seen more in the gastric fundus or body mucosa. And these are fundic gland polyps, usually benign, but adenomas, etc., have been described in fundic gland polyps. Now, what are the neoplasms? Of course, the most common neoplasms, other than these polyps and adenomas, is the adenocarcinoma. Then you can rarely get squamous, adenosquamous, undifferentiated, and neuroendocrine tumors as well. But these are all much rarer. 99% of cases are adenocarcinomas. Now, when you see an adenocarcinoma, especially if it is near the G junction, it is important at that time for the clinician to mention where, where is the epicenter of the tumor. Is it at the G junction and involving the esophagus mainly, where it is then treated like a squamous adenocarcinoma, uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma? Is it just at the G junction with the epicenter in the proximal two centimeter of the uh, G junction, then also? Uh, uh, esophageal type. If it is beyond the proximal two centimeter of the G junction, the epicenter or most of the tumor, then it is treated as a gastric type of adenocarcinoma. So that is important in your biopsy also class. Like all adenocarcinomas in the GIT can have a similar pattern of either tubuloglandular morphology or a mucinous morphology, when more than 50% of the tumor shows mucinous, we say mucinous, and of a signet ring morphology, where sometimes it can be very focal and very subtle, and therefore definitely a pathologist has to look carefully in high part when making a diagnosis of signet ring cell carcinoma of the stomach. It is present in a focal area in one of the tissue pieces because clinically also they may have a linitis plastica type of morphology and so a biopsy, it's not as easy for the endoscopist I suppose to pick up the correct area for biopsy as it is in a ulcero infiltrative a lesion which is more likely to be the typical classical glandular adenocarcinoma. So we look for them in high part and when you see the characteristic signet cells which is rounded cells with the nucleus pushed to the periphery like a signet ring, then it is called a signet ring adenocarcinoma. And now in the WHO classification, 
whether it shows signet ring morphology or just single cell scattered like this, it is called a poorly cohesive carcinoma. If more than 50% of the cells are signet ring, then we call it a signet ring cell type of poorly cohesive carcinoma. These have a worse uh, prognosis. Can we see the poll question nine? <clears throat> Poll question nine. What molecular workup should be done in gastric adenocarcinoma? Should it be HER2 new? Should it be P53? Should it be KI67? Should it be all of the above? What is more essential? Okay, so though amongst those who have answered, 47% um, have said all of the above and 33%, uh, well, now it's become 29% have said HER2 and 41 have said, and then there are the others. So the correct answer is the essential one is actually her to new P53 can help, KI67 not really required. So it's not all of the above. Now HER2 is the most important one, which is uh, recommended uh, in, uh, and I'll come to that later as we discuss. So HER2, uh, <coughs> human epidermal growth factor receptor two, HER2 in gastroesophageal and gastric adenocarcinomas. It was found that targeted therapy with this using Tratsumab which was used initially in breast carcinomas, it actually helped the patients with advanced or metastatic uh, gastroesophageal or gastric adenocarcinomas. So uh, this uh, detection of HER2 new should be done. Now, the um, methods to detect are very well designated for breast adenocarcinoma. And similar stringent criteria has to be followed in gastric and gastrophageal as esophageal adenocarcinoma because it is important for clinical decision making. So whom should be tested? Now, should it be a reflex testing in all or on demand? That's when the clinician asks for it. Usually in advanced or in metastatic cases, not in other cases. So um, this is a choice of the clinician or the institution to decide whether they want it to be on demand or reflex. Definitely only in unequivocal adenocarcinoma, not in dysplasia. It can be done on the primary tumor. When there is metastasis, it can be done on the metastatic tumor. In fact, if the metastatic tumor can be biopsied, then it is ideal to do it on the metastatic tumor. If a patient has received neoadjuvant therapy, then the biopsy, which is showing that there is still an adenocarcinoma, that is where it should be tested, not in the initial biopsy, which was done prior to the new adjuvant therapy. Uh, in a biopsy, preferably you should take six to eight tumor pieces and five separate clusters of tumor cells are assessed when assessing the biopsy. Now, how to test, you may think is for the pathologist, but I've highlighted the things that are important for the clinician. You put a biopsy in formalin, right? You must ensure that the biopsy is placed in formalin immediately within one hour of sampling. Otherwise, it can change the results which affect the whole formalin, 40% formalin, 20% formalin, glucaldehyde, some other medium. No, only 10% and neutral buffered formalin. So it's good to get your formalin from your pathology lab where they prepare neutral buffer formalin. Get your formalin from the labs and place it in your um, endoscope. Same time, six to hours. So you see to the pathology lab. Send it immediately also. Always in the processing hours of formalin. So minimum of six hours will be given to the sample so that you don't have to worry about. What a clinician should not do is allow it to be delayed too much. Because if you delay it more than 72 hours, then it affects the her to new training again. So that should not be done. 
we routine immunohistochemical. If there is a Z1 scoring, it is negative. Uh, I think Madam got disconnected, so we'll just wait for a minute. In the meantime, if students want to have some questions, they can put them on the chat. Yeah, yeah, we'll do one. Uh, I think students have put some messages on the chat. There is one question, ma'am. So should we take how many pieces of biopsy from the poly? Then, uh, one piece is sufficient or multiple pieces required? One question in chat box is there. Uh, Ma'am, you're muted. This is from a polyp. Yes, yes, ma'am. I think Madam's network is. Uh, mm. Issue is there. Yeah, yeah. I think Pooja Ma'am is joined. Yeah, she's joined back. Yeah. 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 So, because we're not talking only about the plastic or question we can. Have. Yeah, Sorry? tell me, tell us, tell us. Uh, ma'am, yeah, yeah. So number of bits for a polyp, yeah. So we are not talking only about hyperplastic. Yeah, so we are also talking about adenomatous polyps. So if we receive the entire polyp, you paint the base, bisect the polyp and process most of it. If you are taking biopsies, then take at least four or five as many biopsies as you can take from the polyp. From the polyp, uh, the more... The better the pathologist always says the more the better. <laughs> but you know, if you're going to look for malignancy, adenomatous change, then definitely more biopsies are better. <coughs> I think there's one more question. Uh, uh, any any more slide, ma'am, from your side? Presentation you can. Well, I have uh, neuroendocrine tumors and lymphomas another five, seven minutes, but it, uh, it's up to you to tell me whether I should carry on or not. We, ha we have time till 1.10, ma'am. So we have around eight minutes. Uh, we have, uh, I think there are a couple of questions. If you can take those questions and then yeah. maybe we can. Another question in chat box is that uh, GAP versus PAG, portal hypertensive gastropathy on histology. Is there any difference? Yeah, so definitely there is difference. Now in portal hypertensive gastropathy, you may see a lot of congestion and uh, you can see dilated tortuous vessels also. But in ga GAVE, you, do, you, you see the classical fibrin thrombi and fibromuscular hyperplasia, which you do not see so much in portal hypertensive gastropathy. Another question is, uh, how many bits of... For H pylori diagnosis, I think uh, Sydney protocol you have already told yes, five, uh, five. Told five biopsies. Yes, five from five. Biopsies from antrum, one from incisura. Yes. Yeah. Another, I, we used to encounter uh, from uh, this uh, histopathology report PPI induced changes. Can you highlight something on that? What is PPI induced changes? So, uh, PPI-induced changes, especially we are referring to when we talk about uh, reactive gastropathy and when there is endocrine cell hyperplasia. So I showed you those pictures of endocrine cell hyperplasia. So when you see endocrine cell hyperplasia and in a background of inflammation or reactive gastropathies, uh, then we call it PPI-induced changes. Uh, again, ma'am... Uh... Whether you are using ISC in all cases to diagnose S. pylori or it is not mandatory? No, we do not use IHC at all, in fact. 
we find that uh, we, I would say IHC should only be, it's not cost effective and it takes time. It's uh, more labor intensive. The easiest is to do a modified gene sustain and a, a good trained pathologists who are seeing this every day can, uh, gastro, uh, you know, pathologists can easily pick up H. pylori. Uh, it also depends on how diligent we are. So if you diligently search for it and you have a modified gene saw or starry stain, you can pick up H. pylori. Another question in chat box. Should all cases reported on Barrett's be referred for second GI pathology scrutiny? No, not Barrett's alone. Only when we're talking about dysplastic change in Barrett's. So only when we're talking about high-grade dysplasia, that too. Because high-grade dysplasia versus low-grade is what is going to change your treatment protocol completely. So when you're going to go in for something like a resection versus, uh, you know, co conservative management, that there, there is no harm in taking a second opinion. So uh, unless you're very sure of your pathologist and all, but there is no harm in such cases. And these are, of course, protocols defined by the West where there's a lot of litigation and, you know, a lot of places that do not have a trained GI pathologist. Then they want that a second opinion from a trained GI pathologist should be taken. So that is a good idea. There is nothing wrong with that but only with high-grade dysplasia, not in any, uh, or, or let us say any dysplastic change in balance, not for just routine diagnosis of balance. Another question is there, I could not get, when to do peritoneal biopsy in uh, carcinoma stomach? Peritoneal biopsy. That's a yes. question for you, Dr. <laughs> Morris. That's, <laughs> no, I, that's why I'm telling them, I don't know why that uh, doctor has asked that question in chat box. I suppose. Uh, obviously. <laughs> Uh, so, so another question from my side, uh, Crohn's uh, disease, you used to take biopsy from the stomach, upper GI also segmental biopsy and how it is useful when there is uh, endoscopically no lesion is there in upper GI, uh, should you go for it and uh, how it is useful just for the sake of audience? So, um... Should you go for it? I am not particularly sure of. Yes, it, if you're clinically suspecting it and you think there is Crohn's in the, uh, you know, lower GI tract, and you're, uh, I, I suppose, if you're unsure of the diagnosis, then upper GI involvement corroborates your diagnosis when you're thinking between UC and Crohn. So then it's useful to take a biopsy. In the biopsy, if you see a granuloma, of course, that helps. A granuloma that is not a tubercular granuloma. That helps a lot. If you don't sleep in the presence of a lot of lymphoid aggregates is another thing that helps a lot to say that this may be Crohn's. So these are the two features I would be looking for. And that H. pylori negative focally active gastritis they used to say that is a criteria for... Uh... Yeah, so any amount of active gastritis, even focally active gastritis, it should raise a red flag to a pathologist to, to look carefully for H. pylori. So it's not, it doesn't have to be a severe gastritis. Even a focally active, that is a small focus of a pititis with abscess, should raise a red flag to a pathologist. And let me look carefully for H. pylori, which may be present in this case. So, uh, you know, sort of sometimes you want the features that should raise your index of suspicion so that you look that much more carefully than you would treat a general, uh, another case. Ideally, you look carefully in all cases. So, Pooja, just a little question around this only. How often do you use the Sydney classification to give your report for chronic active gastritis? So, um, ideally, one should use the Sydney classification always. I would say that if I'm sure I'm getting the Fab 5 biopsies, then I'm happy to use the Sydney classification. But if I'm not getting that, then it may not make sense to use the Sydney classification and rather I may just report exactly on what I'm seeing. But ideally that is the format at least that you follow for most biopsies. Okay. So there is another question I think on the chat box. Manas, can you just uh, go forward with that? Um, uh... <laughs> that is regarding culture of H. pylori. How to send that? So, uh, if Pooja ma'am want to take that I'm or we will, <laughs> <laughs> we will ask microbiologist colleague. We will ask our microbiologist colleague. 
uh, take that question. Again, uh, from this, uh, you have told uh, to take all the Fab 4, uh, Fab 5 uh, tissue in same bottle. Same bottle. That can be no, the same bottle. No need to take uh, entrum, body. Um, no, you don't need to. That can be put in the same bottle, the Fab 5. Again, like I say, as long as you're following that protocol routinely. Ab aaj aapne paanch beje hain, kal do beje hain, then I don't know what you sent in the bottle now, whether you sent one body, one antrum, whatever you sent. So if then it is better to take separately or at least clearly mention that, I, that one sample from body, one from antrum has been put in this bottle. Then also it's okay. But if you're taking the fab five, all five can be put in the same bottle. Only any other area that looks different, that should be labeled separately and put in a separate bottle. So now ma'am, that's all question that is in chat box, no more questions. Okay. okay. I think then we have to thank Pooja for that lovely session. It reminded me of my PG days when we used to sit in these pathology classes. And I think that um, Barrett's one was uh, really, really useful. Of course, the whole thing was. For me, the Barrett's was the most important uh, because I work on these things. But having said that, I think it's important we take biopsies. And uh, if we don't take biopsies, whatever we do with our visual impact is actually sometimes uh, wrong, uh, especially in areas that look abnormal. Uh, which is why if you go to the uh, Southeast Asian countries, they keep on biopsying the stomach because they want to pick up early gastric cancer. Now, I know that early gastric cancer isn't common in our population, but with newer data, I think gastric cancer is coming up to be a little more common than we thought about 20 years ago. Uh, I think it's important to take abnormal areas biopsies and please prime your pathologist. Because this is not the pathologist's MD exam. If you don't tell them what you're looking for, they will just report a standard gastritis and send it back to you. And thank you, Pooja. That was a lovely session. So uh, again, I thank uh, Professor Sakuja for the wonderful talk. Uh, and again, I also thank our panelists, uh, Shubhna Madam and Manas for sparing time on, uh, on a Sunday uh, afternoon. So uh, I'd like to close the session now. So uh, thank you again for joining this ISD masterclass. We have the next masterclass in two weeks. I think we've finished with our pathology sessions, uh, all four sessions of pathology. Next, we are going to start uh, sessions on radiology. So that will be after two weeks. I, I think the flyer will be sent out by the ISD office. Again, thank you so much on behalf of the ISD. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.